Good morning, Gospel Next. Uh, it gives me great honor and privilege to invite you into our church home, uh, Jill and Tom's quarters here in Fort Myer. Uh, if you see behind me over the top of my head, you'll see it's the gathering place. And so today we receive you into our home as I bring the Word of God in our worship service today. It is my distinct honor and privilege as the Chief of Chaplains to be able to do that for and with you in this virtual means today as we find ourselves facing this global pandemic together and its impacts in our world. And in that light, I would ask that you join me in a word of prayer today as we invite God's presence, uh, not only already here in our time together, but as He brings forth the words that He's laid, laid upon my heart, and that His Holy Spirit would impart them to all of us and that we be instructed through them. Please join me in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are sovereign and that you are in control and that you have us in your hands. And in these times, these trying times of this global pandemic and its impact and loss of life, those who are affected with the virus physically and families who have been impacted and the concerns, the fears, the worries, the anxieties that we feel and the way that it's changed our very lives and impacted our world and global economy. We ask God that whatever you're doing sovereignly through all of this, that you would enable us, your people, to be in step with you. That you would give us your peace, that you would give us clear understanding that you are in control and that you care for us and that you have our very lives in your hands. We pray today, God, that as we break bread together over your word, Lord, that that, that word would bring life and hope uh, and confidence and renewed vigor to your people. Now, God, please send your spirit to help us to, to hear, to see, and to discern what your will is for our lives. I pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, today I want to talk to you uh, under the theme of people first and winning matters. And if that sounds like I've taken it from somewhere, if you're in the Army, you probably know it came from the Chief of Staff of the Army, General McConville, when he laid out his strategy, his people first strategy, and winning matters. And in God's economy, God has put people first. He demonstrated that to a sinful world in sending his son, Jesus Christ, putting people even above him, his very self. And then winning matters. We know we have the rest of the story. We know that those who are in Christ are on the winning team. And winning in life and in eternal life genuinely really matters. Well, today, I want you to think about something uh, with me, if you would. And how will God use your life to affect the lives of others? And recognizing that we are not going to realize the full effect or full impact of, that, of those actions. So how is God going to use us to affect the lives of other people in the ways that we nor they will fully comprehend or realize in our finite modality that we currently find ourselves in. So what's in a name? And when you think about the names of people who have impacted your life, what faces come to you? What surfaces as you ponder who's had an impact, a profound impact in your life? What people come to your mind? Today we're going to look at the final chapter of Romans, the final, the, the closure of, of Paul's communique to the people in Rome. We're going to see a list of names. We're going to see that Paul is inspired by the Holy Spirit to save them for us and to be instructed through them. As we think about this passage, I want you to highlight the importance of of the people listed in Romans 16 as we unpackage this together today and see how God used people to affect the lives of other people and over time in ways that they didn't even realize and then in turn templating ourselves over this context to say how can God use our lives to touch the lives of other people in ways that we nor they will fully realize or comprehend. So how are we making a ripple, if I may use that term? In the Chaplain Corps, we talk about our motto is investing in people, connecting them in spirit, and cultivating them in community. 
So what are we doing to invest in people and connecting others in spirit and cultivating them in community? And you can see that in the pages of Romans 16 that that is exactly what Paul is communicating to his people as he closes out this epistle. He lets them know that God is in charge and he has a handle on their circumstances. He knows what they're going through. He has called them out as people to be his servants, to follow after him in obedience. Those three things. God is in charge. God calls people and he calls them to walk in obedience to him. I'm going to highlight some of the names in this passage. Not all of them because time will not allow. But I want us to see the vast array, the broad array of people that are mentioned here in the scriptures. If you would join with me as they've already been read, I'm going to highlight a few. Phoebe, and what stands out about her and her name? Bright and radiant one. Well, she's a servant. She's a saint. And that term servant is not what we typically think of as deaconess, translate, deaconess as we see it translated that way in other places, but it's really her standing as a servant, not a position or station in the body of Christ. We see that she was a businesswoman, that she was in Rome on business twofold. She was there to take care of her business, and she was also delivering Paul's epistle to the church there in Rome. You see that she was a, a person who had established a church in uh, Centria, and in Centria, she did God's work, and that was her base of operations, and now she's traveling. It's obvious that she's a woman of standing, and she's known for aiding and befriending the people of God. Paul instructs them very carefully. He uses the word strapotos, which means to protect. It says that if anything she has need of, because she has been a helper of many, make sure that she has what she needs. Protect her. She's carrying something of great value and great worth. It is ultimately God's word inspired for us who believe. So Phoebe, the first person mentioned right out of the starting block, and it's a woman. Paul's sending a message breaking down barriers, and you're going to see this as we go through the list of breaking down barriers between men and women and seeing them as created equal in the sight of God. The next people that are mentioned are Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla means venerable. Aquila means eagle. We see that Priscilla is mentioned first, again, highlighting that the broken down order of what was traditional hierarchy, male-dominated society. And we see that she is a woman also of standing, a woman of great usefulness and of value and a gifted person. We see that their combined marriage exemplifies a beautiful relationship between a man and a woman, totally committed to Jesus Christ. They were hospitable people. They were known for their encouragement of others and for others. They were cooperative people. They were with Paul in Corinth. They were with him in Ephesus. And now they're with him in Rome. They're, they're doing and serving. They are fellow workers. They are co-laborers with him. They were willing to lay their lives down on the line. Not only for Paul, but for the church and for Gentiles and others. They were willing to take risk for the sake of the gospel. They had a house church where many, many, many people came to Christ. Many people on this list in Romans came to faith in Christ through their efforts. And then we see as we continue on the list, we see Epanetus, who was the first among the first believers in Achaia. And then Mary, who is known for her strong labor. And then Andronicus and Junia. Countrymen, they came from the same region. They were Jewish converts. They are also his fellow prisoners. 
They were noteworthy among the apostles, and they came to Christ before him. And then we see other people noted for their love for the Lord, for their hard labor, their work. We see others who are mentioned uh, who are in households of unbelievers. We see slaves mentioned. We see people taking risk of their faith because in many cases they did it at peril of their own life. We see that people are mentioned for what they did to contribute to the community, the household of faith. We see the, the name Rufus mentioned in verse 13. And Rufus was the son of Simon of Cyrene who carried the cross of Christ when he could no longer carry it. And he's captured here, so we see that that lineage of Simon is, is that Christian lineage continues in Rufus and in that family. And then we see other new, numer, uh, named people, numerously uh, named people um, who are listed there that Paul wants to make sure they get some form of recognition for their service. And he calls them all saints. They are all saints together. As we look at this community of people and we think of their story, we see people who were free. We see people who were slaves. We see men. We see women. We see people from different ethnic groups. We see Jews, Gentiles. We see people of great standing business people. We see people who are just common. We see people who are servential in their efforts. And what we see is the gospel is spreading. It's touched Asia Minor. It's, it's spread through the Holy Roman Empire. In only two and a half decades, God's people are making a difference in ways they didn't even realize were possible as they walk in obedience. As you think, as I asked you to think about your own personal story, and as I think about the people in my life, and as you think about the people in your life who've had a, an impact, an effect on us, who made a difference, uh, two, for me, two people come immediately to the fray. As a young person, I joined the army to get away from a broken home and a rebellious childhood. I was in search of some kind of purpose. I was broken in spirit, making all the wrong choices, drug addiction and everything else, entered the military, brought all that with me. At a time in our nation, we were racially divided. We were, Vietnam was winding down, 1974. Vietnam was coming to an end. It ended in 1975. And I went to my first duty assignment, which was overseas in Germany. And there I encountered a person of faith, a person who knew that God had a purpose and plan for his life, a person who was living out his call, a person who was walking in obedience. That person was an African-American named Doc McElroy, a medic. And suffice all the details, Doc was there at a time in my life when I needed him most. And through my relationship with him, I came to a personal faith in Jesus Christ. And Doc took me in to his gospel congregation, and that gospel congregation loved on me. They accepted me. I was the only one of my kind in their family. But they cared for me. And then Doc McElroy introduced me to the chaplain, Sam Sanford, who brought me into his home and showed me what a loving Christian family is like. They, they discipled me. They invested in me. They loved me. They were both Doc and Sam and Linda were laborers, co-laborers, co-workers, working with God's spirit, working with God's people, doing God's business as his servants. People, people who make a difference. Well, how about you? Who's made a ripple in your life? Who's impacted you? It's people, 
God's people that impact us. And then, you know, we're called to walk in obedience. And so as God demonstrates His plan for our lives, as it is revealed to us, He calls us as people, and He calls us to walk in obedience. It says in Romans chapter 16, verse 6, it says that, Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Two things. Number one, the holy kiss. We're going to have to do something about that since we're supposed to keep distancing, physical distancing. We might have to blow a kiss. But it's the disposition, really, that's being related of how we should treat each other with love and affection, with kindness and warmth, with genuine care and concern. And then there's also the message that, Rome, you're not alone. You're a part of a larger body. There are many people walking in obedience with you. What a word of encouragement to the people as they're living in Rome and, and often persecuted for their faith. And then it, warned, it gives us a warning. Paul gives us a warning in verses 17 and 18. He says, there's some people I need you to be aware of. They cause division. They bring offense. They're greedy. They're selfish. They're after their own interests. They're not serving the interests of Jesus Christ. He warns us to stay away from them after they've been warned. They are deceivers. And then in verse 19, he calls us to walk in obedience for your obedience has become known to all. Think of that. You in Rome, your faithfulness, your obedience, not only the people named, but the church in Rome, you've become renowned for your faithfulness. Think of that. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf for that word. And then Paul says, be wise about what is good. Choose the very best. And be innocent or be wary. Stay away from that which is evil. An admonition to seek for excellence and to walk away from that which would destroy. And then in verse 20 is a beautiful promise. And the God of peace, and in light of where we are today, in light of what we're facing, there's a promise here for not only the Roman people, but for us. Because God, when He lives in us, when Christ lives in us, when Christ is in us, we can know His peace. No matter what our circumstances, because we know that God has those circumstances in control. He has them in His hands. He's aware of every detail. They are part of His divine purpose and plan for us. And then there's another promise the evil one, the one who seeks to destroy, God promises that he will crush him under your feet. So they were to take courage knowing that their peace came from their relationship with their God and that he would deal with the one who came to seek, to kill, and destroy. So those promises, they're true for us today. And then he shouts out again to some other people as he closes out. Calls out Timothy, Lucius, Jason, Sisyphus, my fellow countrymen. And then the person who penned it, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. God working through people who walked in obedience. God using people to make a difference in the lives of people and to the extent of which they didn't fully realize or understand. It's not, brothers and sisters, just a list of names. It is a list of people who were known by God, who were faithful, who were saints, His servants, and they are preserved 
in antiquity for us. And then he concludes with this benediction. He says, he mentions Gaius and Cordus and Erastus. And then he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, and then he continues, he knows that he's not going to see them again. You see, Paul, although a prisoner, twice in his life, really, first a prisoner to sin, he was a slave to sin, and then on the road to Damascus, the shackles of his slavery were torn off. And then walking in obedience in Christ, he was again put in prison in shackles. But as a shackled man had more freedom than any other prisoner in his company. You see, Paul's chains were God's plan and they were our freedom. They were the people of that time's freedom. Paul's bondage was our liberty. So if Paul was to add your name to the list, what would it say? What would be written about you? What would be written about me? What is our life's contribution? How are we going to be spiritually remembered, our spiritual reputation? How will God use your life, my life, to affect the lives of other people in ways that none of us realize? Think of this, friends. Did Paul know that the epistle that was penned by Tertius would somehow be known by the whole world and be preserved for the ages? And that men and women in future generations would come to faith in Jesus Christ through the words penned by his servant, the scribe. You see, friends, we touch lives when we are walking in obedience to God. We touch the lives of people. We touch the world in a way that we will never fully realize, understand, or comprehend. Only God sees those things. And I want to tell you today, friends, the good news is that the ink is still wet. And the pen is in God's hand. And he is writing another chapter and it is not yet finished. He's calling you and I into relationship with Him to walk in obedience and to allow Him to fulfill His plans and purposes in our life. You see, the pages of our story are yet to be written. Some of it's begun, but it isn't finished. Now our names are recorded if we have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ in the Lamb's Book of Life. They're preserved. But our spiritual reputation is still being written. So as we reflect today on the message in Romans that Paul wrote from prison and realizing that it would be probably the last words that he would ever speak to the church in Rome, he was calling people to himself. He had called them to service. He had called them to walk in obedience. And their names are preserved here for us. Now I know in our worshiping community today, there are names of people. I'm going to throw a few out there. There might be an Alice, a Sean, a Rochelle, a Frank, a Valerie, a Sarah, a Shannon, a Jake, a Jeanette, Frederick, Sharon, Jess, Ben, Joyce, Jameson, Stuart, Shanique, Sam, Tom, Jill, Bill, Robin, Jim, others. What will be written about you, what will be written about me? What is our spiritual legacy? Were we totally committed to Christ? 
Were we totally devoted servants? Were we willing to lay down our lives for Him? Friends, God can do through us the things that will touch the lives of other people in ways that we do not fully understand or comprehend, nor do they. So friends, I call you today to be servants of the Most High, and I close with this benediction. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith, to God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ, forever. Amen. Paul concludes, Paul concludes, but saying ultimately at the end of the day, it is God who is in control, and it is He who will ultimately be honored, and it is He in whom we will all ultimately spend eternity with forever. Friends, I want to close today with this simple admonition that Please understand that if you're in Christ, He has a plan and purpose for your life. His Spirit re resides in you and His peace and His power are resident within you. Lean on Him, trust Him. And friends, if you're listening today, wherever this, this uh, cap, telecast is gone, and if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you're not a part of the faith community, I invite you today to, to look at the book of Romans. It's an excellent treatise on what it is that God has done on our behalf, that we are all sinners, and that we can only be saved by grace through faith. It is not of works. It is His work already accomplished on the cross, and then He rose again from the dead, and He calls us to Himself. So if you're in the sound of my voice today, friends, and you want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's a simple prayer. It's acknowledging that you, like us, are sinful. It's acknowledging your need for a Savior and inviting Him to take up residence in you so that you might know the peace that passes all understandings that will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now may the Lord bless you from the top of your head to the very soles of your feet, and may He keep you in His hand always. Until we meet again, friends, God bless you.